Coming up on iOS Today, Rosemary Orchard is back, and we are talking about taking your devices offline. Yes, there are times when it is time to step away from the Wi-Fi, the cellular data, or some semblance of that. And so we are going to give you the tips and tricks you need to know to help you do that. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is iOS Today, episode 616, recorded Tuesday, August 23rd, 2022. Taking your iPhone offline. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by Nomad. Go to nomadgoods.com slash iOS Today and use the promo code iOS Today for 10% off your first purchase of any Nomad accessory. They have Apple Watch straps, wireless chargers, ultra durable cables, and more. This is a limited time offer. And by eight sleep. Good sleep is the ultimate game changer, and the pod is the ultimate sleep machine. Go to 8sleep.com slash iOS to check out the pod and save $150 at checkout. 8sleep currently ships within the USA, Canada, the UK, and select countries in the EU and Australia. Welcome back to iOS Today. I am Micah Sargent, and I am excited to get this show underway. Of course, this is the show where we talk all things iOS, iPadOS, tvOS, watchOS, HomePadOS, HomePadOS? No, HomePodOS. You see, it is all the software platforms Apple has on offer. We love to talk about them here on iOS Today, uh, and I am excited to say that Rosemary Orchard is back. Hello, Rosemary. Mm-hmm. Hi, I'm excited to be back after my week of basically having no internet, which may or may not be the inspiration for today's episode. <laughs> I love that. You know, I, I haven't done a whole lot of travel, but uh, the, the few times that you have uh, traveled when you've come back, you have great topics that are related to what you've just done. And so it's fantastic because you kind of have firsthand experience with those. So I'm very excited about the ones, uh, the one that we're going to talk about today with this one. Um Let's let's be open minded, folks, because while we're talking about taking our devices offline, we also are going to be talking about taking your devices kind of away from the networks that they are used to. So there may still be some online tips and tricks, but those have to do with just being away from kind of the home Wi-Fi or the office Wi-Fi that you use day in and day out. So I just wanted to address that off the top so nobody got too pedantic about it uh, as we cover these topics. So with all of that said, let's talk about how to uh, navigate the iPhone and, uh, in some cases, the iPad as we are kind of stepping away from our home networks and uh, feeling free to move about the country. Uh, what is your first tip for us, Rosemary? Well, my first tip for folks is that even if you use a music subscription service, then you should be able to download that music. Um, and uh, Apple Music supports this. Spotify supports this. Uh, you, you have to be paying for Spotify. You can't do this as Spotify free, to be clear. Um, and so do some other services. Like if you have uh, Plex as your whole media system, then there is a great app called PlexAmp, which will allow you to download music from your music library offline on your phone to play it back. So you can just add music to your library and then download it to play it. Um, And that is something that I feel maybe occasionally folks uh, kind of forget is an option because we're so used to just being able to stream everything. And then suddenly, you know, you're you're not streaming uh, anymore because you don't have internet and that's not working very well. Um, So I would definitely recommend that people have a quick look and check those options out. Uh, And uh, I can actually show folks on my iPad, uh, I believe, uh, if I've uh, got the music app there, I've just discovered once again that my iPhone that worked in the pre-show, not working so well on uh, the actual uh, live show, which is annoying. But if you uh, open a playlist in Apple Music, then you should see a download button in the top right-hand corner next to the three dots. And this is the same whether you're on iPhone or iPad. And if you tap that button, then it will start downloading the songs in that playlist. But something that's a bonus trick for people, because I know people always love having an extra bonus trick. If you mm-hmm. create a smart playlist, and you need to do this, unfortunately, on your Mac, um, you can't create smart playlists on iOS, uh, but you can do a smart playlist on your Mac, you can just add all your music to it. Okay. I personally recommend that you maybe exclude the things that you mark as one star, but then you can download that playlist on your iPhone or iPad, and that's all of your music. 
So that that's uh, an extra bonus tip for folks because you can download things and you can see now it's uh, downloading this Disney Hits uh, playlist, uh, which I think I actually found on Apple Music. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I'm going to have a Disney sing along later, Micah, and I'm going to be able to do it without <laughs> internet, which, you know, if you're doing a long car journey, for example, you're driving a, a long distance and you are being passed off between cell towers on the way there, or there's some stretches with poor internet, you don't want to be reliant on having music streamed to you. You want to have it ready because the worst thing in the world is when you're there and you're just getting into a really good song and then it, it cuts out because it it hasn't got enough of it in the buffer and then you just have to sit in silence until you get back to data. That's terrible. So download some music on your device. Yes. And I, I think that, you know, a lot of times the way that we use music this, these days uh, is often with streaming services, in this case, Apple music. And there is that sort of lack of understanding surrounding kind of how it works because we're so used to just, I can go pop in, find any track that I want and listen to it. And there are some folks, uh, myself included, who have purchased music in the past and may continue to purchase music uh, that is available in their library. And having both of them in your library at the same time can lead to confusion over what is actually available uh, at, you know, at the tap of a button versus what is not available. And depending on how you have your uh, iCloud settings and your storage settings all set up, that can all make a difference in whether or not those apps or whether that music will be available to you. And so that's something to keep in mind uh, that you are oftentimes uh, streaming the music that you have uh, unless you set up some different settings like the setting in music that lets you kind of choose to have some music stored locally uh, using the downloads option in the settings app. So launching the settings app, choosing music, choosing downloads and looking there. There are lots of different options um, including seeing what music is downloaded to your device, uh, choosing to optimize the storage, which says, at the most, I want this amount of my storage to be able to be used for music. And so on the this iPad that I have, this iPad mini, I've said up to 64 gigabytes of storage can be used for uh, music. And then what happens is this music will uh, automatically download when I add playlists and will be available for uh, use offline, but it will only use that much. So that way I know that, you know, I'm only devoting this part of my storage to it. And most of the time that works for me because I am listening in places where uh, streaming it is just fine. But just being aware of that right before you take a trip is a good idea because mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you've had this happen before. I certainly have had this happen before where there was the one time where I completely forgot to check my music before I took the trip. And then when I was in a place where there was no cellular access and no Wi-Fi access, I had maybe two songs I could listen to. And that was not fun. I wanted definitely wanted more than just the two songs that I had to listen to. Yeah, yeah. Listening to two songs on repeat, that's a fast way to go. A little bit uh, crazy there, Micah. And it, it's <laughs> always the two songs that you don't want as well, like I'm a Barbie Girl and Clint Million or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Like, like, why did they, I ever they're add they're that to my library? <laughs> yeah, they're fine mixed in with a whole bunch of other things. But then like when you just have the two of them on repeat, no, that's not cool. Um, yes, and the limiting is a really good point. That's something um, that uh, I, I think it was uh, Wonder Warthog noted in the uh, Club to Discord where he his 506 uh yeah 516 gigabyte uh iPhone was full um and it was because it was all the music he downloaded so that's something else but whether you're going all plane trip or even just a, a longer car journey it's worth downloading some music in advance and keeping it offline um and uh, the same can apply to a whole bunch of other things as well um, such as music, um, like all of the apps like Plex and Netflix and Disney Plus and Apple TV have download options built into them where you can download an episode or multiple episodes offline so that you can use them, uh, watch these things later. Um, I am going to throw in a special shout out for Plex because I've ripped all of my DVDs. So I've got them in Plex. 
And one of the things that I really love, um, I will just uh, open up a TV show that I'm watching right now. I'm working my way through Star Trek Voyager. No spoilers, folks. Um, but if I tap on the download option, then it will schedule a download. But if I if I actually go to the season or the show, when I tap download, I don't just download that one episode. I can say download all of the episodes or the next five unplayed or the next 20 unplayed and similar, which is just really nice to have. Uh, that's from the season view. If I uh, then went to the uh, the show view, then when I tap download, then I get to do it from the entire season as well. And you can have the the uh, episodes automatically deleted as well. And most apps like, you know, Disney Plus and Netflix and so on have got all of these options built in. So take a look at those. And especially if you think, oh, like, I don't know what the network is going to be like. Just download a couple of episodes before you go and, and take them with you. It gives you more options uh, when you are somewhere. And if you didn't need it, well, you downloaded it when you had good internet. And I don't know about you, Micah, but I find when I'm traveling, I end up with bad internet. Like, it's not, like, so terrible that I can't do anything. But it is the sort of thing where streaming tends to just sort of break up. And, like, big file downloads will fail. Like, updating my iOS device will be something that takes a really long time. Or you've got a really low download limit. Like, the the, the place I was at in France has satellite internet, which has 30 megabytes down, or 30 megabits down. It's not terrible. Two megabits upload. Oh, no, that's not going to work for recording iOS today. And it's got a 50 gigabyte a month limit. Like most cellular plans have got more than that. Um, and if there were cellular data, that would be, you know, a better option. But there isn't. And so you have to kind of work around having a poor internet connection in some places. And I know you've got a great recommendation for when you are using your iPhone as a connection from your Mac. Yes, absolutely. So this is, um, th this of course is one of these times where it's not just uh, not just a completely offline situation. Um, we there. <laughs> There are times where you are out and about and you want to be able to use the Mac that you have with you uh, while perhaps while you're traveling. Maybe you're getting a little bit of work done on your vacation, uh, which you know you, you would like to not have to do, but occasionally have to do. And so you have to use your Mac and the only cell service you have, the only internet service you have is via your iPhone or your iPad. Um, it's likely the case that you don't want to go over on your data cap if you have one, or even if you're using unlimited data, um, it's it may be the case that over a certain amount of data streamed, then it starts to throttle your service. And so you'd like to keep yourself from uh, running into that. Uh, so I wanted to mention an app for the Mac. Yes, <gasps> Gasp iOS today, we're talking about an app for the Mac uh, called Trip Mode. And Trip Mode is a great app for helping to cut back on the data that you're using. And in fact, I've used it in the past um, when I needed kind of a quick solution before I sort of was able to go through and, and set up all of the, my settings exactly how I wanted them. Trip Mode was a way for me when I'm doing a podcast uh, by enabling it, I can cut back on what data is going where. So let me talk about what Trip Mode does. Trip Mode is a filter for your internet connection and it will block the different systems and services, or rather uh, services and settings that you don't want to connect to the internet uh, from connecting to the internet. So for example, on my Mac, I've got Dropbox, I've got uh, Backblaze backup system, I've got Time Machine. Uh, in this case, I've got Zoom running, I've got Textual, Safari, all sorts of things that are in touch with the internet pretty regularly. And when you turn on trip mode, trip mode will block all of the connections except for the ones that you want. So in the case of a podcaster, it's a great way to make sure that only Zoom and Safari, which you or whatever browser you're using to uh, connect with the Internet and the chat services that you're using. So in my case, textual and discord are the only things that get to talk to the internet and everything else does not. So that way, in the background, I don't accidentally have a, a, a an update happening or syncing happening that cuts up my uh, signal and makes it, and my bandwidth, and makes it so that I don't uh, have as clear a picture as I possibly can. But this is not just for podcasters. As I said, this was really created. I mean, it's called trip mode. It's created for people to use while you're on the go. So that way you can say, 
you know, I need to use Safari on my Mac while I'm on this trip. I can't just use it on my phone, but I don't want to burn up all the data that I have. So you turn on trip mode and then you only toggle on the option for Safari. And then that browser is the only thing that gets to talk to the internet. And so you're cutting back on the po potential for, uh, you know, too much data being used. And this is a way to do it on the Mac, but Apple has added something similar uh, to iOS directly, iOS and iPadOS directly. Tell us about that, Rosemary. Yeah, so there's this really great feature and you can use this on any network, including when you're tethering to another device. Um, and so I'm just going to quickly retether my iPad to my iPhone so that I can demonstrate this uh, in, in the tethering section for you because other networks you see, you, you may be able to, if you've pre-configured them, set this up in advance, but for your for your tethering to your, your devices, it only works actually once you're on that device. Um, and so I'll just unlock my iPhone and hopefully that will speed that up. But what you can do inside of the settings app is you can tap on the iBubble next to any network connection. It's of course not tethering to my iPhone now, so I'll just do it this on my home network. There's an option here for low data mode. And this low data mode can be incredibly useful when you are on, say, uh, a device that you know has got a limited internet connection or just, it, it, you know, if it's uh, limited downloads, um, then that's definitely a benefit because this then reports back to apps that it's using cellular data. And this is a huge advantage because there are a number of apps on iOS where you can say, hey, no, uh, you know, don't, don't do this automatically on cellular data. Like Apollo for Reddit will say uh, autoplay videos, but you can turn that off for cellular data to save some of your, your mobile bandwidth. And then when you're in low data mode, this applies as well. And that's very, very useful. And so you can turn that on and off for specific networks. And I found this to be incredibly useful when, um, you know, when I'm traveling and I've got really rubbish hotel internet and I just want the thing that I'm doing to work, but none of the other stuff that happens in the background to work, then that will do that. So that is a feature that you can enable. And I, I highly recommend having a look at that. I have that set up by default for a number of networks. The only caveat to this is if you know somebody whose preferred method of, hey, don't connect to this Wi-Fi network for a bit, is to go into uh, the settings and then tap the forget this network, it will forget this setting. And then it will reapply. It won't reapply next time you join the network, um, which is how I found out why my mom was chewing up so much data while we were in France, <laughs> because at some point she turned her phone off from the network and then rejoined, like she'd just forgotten the network and then rejoined it. And I was like, mom, if you, if you don't want to connect, seriously, there, there's a there's a button, which is actually re really useful right here. Auto join, turn that off for any networks that you don't want auto joining and slow networks um, because your, your networks by default sync um, or this is not by default, they do, they sync between your devices. So your iPhone, your iPad, your Mac, they all have the same Wi-Fi network information. And so if you forget that network on one device, it will then forget it on all your other devices. Um, and this can be very useful, but also a complete another pain when you don't want your phone on that network. So tap, turn off the auto join for that network and then you can disconnect and you know, you'll be fine. It, it's not gonna auto join. You can turn off your Wi-Fi network until the end of the day by swiping down from that top right um, on your iPhone or iPad and then tapping that Wi-Fi uh, icon and that turns off your Wi-Fi network until the end of the day. Um, and then, you know, it'll turn back on at midnight and you'll be good to go for the next day. Nice. All right, we're going to take a quick break before we come back with some more tips, tricks, apps, etc. to help you go offline with your devices. I want to tell you about Nomad who are bringing you this episode of iOS today. I've said it before, I'm very excited about Nomad being on the network because I have uh, purchased Nomad products for years and have always really liked them. And in the past, they've even been a pick of the week of mine uh, on the show because they make great stuff. In fact, right in front of me, I have uh, the Nomad leather case for AirPods Pro. This is a two-piece case um, made of leather that slides onto the case for your AirPods Pro. And it's got a nice little uh, opening in the back so that the lid opens very easily and closes. And what I love is that on the side, there are there's a little area to fasten a lanyard loop to it. And so my AirPods are very easy to find and very easy to carry with me because of the case that it comes in. And 
I, as I said, I've had this for ages and it still looks so doggone good. It's uh, it, it's this beautiful Horween leather that uh, Nomad uses from the Horween Tannery in Chicago. This this was a uh, tannery founded in 1905 and Nomad uses them because of the unparalleled blend of quality and consistency that I can vouch for in terms of having these different Nomad products and having these devices, uh, these, these device coverings in this case, that just last and last and last and frankly get better with age. That's one of the things that makes it so awesome. But honestly, that is not all. One of my favorite products uh, that Nomad offers um, is slash are the different cables that Nomad has. And that is for multiple reasons. Firstly, it is because uh, many of them are made with uh, Kevlar woven in, so they're incredibly resilient. And I've, I've mentioned before, I've got one that um, I have kind of on the floor because it's running to uh, a place where I can plug in devices that I need to plug in when I need to plug them in. And I regularly roll over it with this heavy chair I sit in never been a problem, never causes a short in that cable. It always, uh, it, you know, plugs in and works just as it needs to. But what I also like is the clever design that you can get with these cables. This is a USB-C uh, to USB-C cable. Both sides of it feature USB-C charging. Um, so, you, you know, you can plug it in as USB-C on one side, USB-C on the other. But if at any point you need to use USB-A or micro USB, then there are these little uh, ports that are sort of uh, connected to the cable. You slide it up and you slide the USB-C uh, or slide it over the USB-C. And now suddenly I've got USB-A on one side, still USB-C on the other, or I could change this to micro USB uh, right there on the other end. And I don't have to think about needing a separate dongle, needing a separate separate adapter, needing more than one cable. It's all just built in right on this cable. And it comes with included uh, cable management via a loop that they have connected to the cable. So if any, if, if you skip everything else that Nomad offers, do not skip out on these cables. It is the, you, you can buy uh, you know, three of these cables, these universal cables, and you're good to go. You've got every kind of cable you need right there. In any case, all of these Nomad products, um, I love that Nomad really focuses on quality. These things last for years and years and years. Um, I've got an Apple watch band from Nomad that I've had for ages. The, it's a leather one and it still looks and smells amazing uh, to this day, if you like uh, leather. Nomad also offers AC adapters. Uh, if you'd like to check those out, they've got a 30-watt adapter and a 65-watt adapter. These are both GAN adapters, which are well worth checking out. All of it very, very uh, well-designed and also supreme charging. Uh, this is the 65 watt fast charger. You see it has two, uh, well, you may be able to see, it has two USB-C ports on the front uh, that offers dynamic power allocation. That means that if you plug in two devices that require different charging speeds or different, uh, different charge loads, then it is smart enough to know how to kind of uh, cut between the two. So, uh, go to nomadgoods.com slash iOS today and use the promo code iOS today. If you do so, that's going to get you 10% off your first purchase of any Nomad accessory. Please use that code, use that URL, nomadgoods.com slash iOS today with the promo code iOS today. This is a limited time offer. And folks, I'd love it if you do go to nomadgoods.com slash iOS today, use that promo code iOS today let us know. I'd love to hear what you got from uh, Nomad, what uh, what was worth it for you, what you checked out, and uh, what you think of it. So yeah, nomadgoods.com slash iOS today with the promo code iOS today. Thanks so much to Nomad for sponsoring this week's episode of iOS today. Now let's head back to the show. Uh, I'll kick things off with just a quick tip that I have. Again, we're talking about thing uh, using your devices offline. But when we talk about being offline, we're also talking about being elsewhere. Uh, you may touch down and uh, have Wi-Fi at the airport or Wi-Fi at the hotel or Wi-Fi at a local coffee shop. And I just wanted to mention that 
you know, you may have uh, the idea that it's not a good thing to use Wi-Fi from these places and that, you know, the, the free Wi-Fi is dangerous. And certainly that is something that you have to keep in mind. But don't completely forego the option of using Wi-Fi that is available in one of these places if you are protecting yourself with a VPN. Um, there are loads of different VPNs out there, and I will... Uh, I, I can't think of a situation where I would recommend a free one uh, because of the way the VPNs work. You're essentially taking all of your activity and piping it through the VPN that you're using, which means that that virtual private network company is going to have knowledge of the way that you're browsing online. So you really need to trust the VPN that you're using. And uh, if they are a free VPN, then it's likely that uh, they're making their money through some other means, because there's no way to keep the business running to keep those servers going uh, if they are not. And so that's uh, something that you have to keep in mind. Uh, they are a sponsor on the network, but I do want to mention, because it is genuinely the VPN that I've used for years, ExpressVPN, um, because of how easy it is to get uh, ExpressVPN set up, but also because I have done the research, the legwork uh, to read up on how ExpressVPN is protecting uh, my privacy. And, uh, you know, there was concern about an acquisition of the company by a different company. And uh, ExpressVPN addresses that in its privacy policy and talks about uh, the way that it works. And ExpressVPN, most importantly, is constantly audited and uh, has on occasion been what VPN providers call, kind of jokingly, auditing by a government, uh, which is a situation where a government comes to them and says, hey, we want all of the data that you have. And confirmed, ExpressVPN said, we don't have any data that you would need because we of the way that we do our service, where all the stuff that they do is run on RAM. So um, I just wanted to mention using a VPN while you're connecting to Wi-Fi networks. They're not sponsoring this episode or anything like that. I just, uh, if I'm going to talk about a VPN, I want to give a suggestion, a recommendation. And uh, for me, that's ExpressVPN. But uh, there are lots of options out there. Um, all right. Uh, Rosemary, you've got some different apps that you mention uh, that can be helpful whenever you are not, uh, whenever you're not connected or you are connected to perhaps a network that is not as fast. <laughs> Yes. And before I get to that, I did just want to uh, add an extra bonus tip for folks because I have run into this myself before where you have a great setting turned on in the storage area on your in general settings on your iPhone or iPad. So if you go into settings in general um, and then storage, then there's this great feature called offload unused apps. And look, it can save 13.9 gigabytes of my iPad mini. Uh, I have a 256 gigabyte iPad mini. I'm using 74 gigabytes. I don't need to save those 13.9 gigabytes. Also, it can can like, you know, help me delete large attachments and so on. But if you've enabled this, then there's a chance, especially if you're running low on storage space, that your iPad's going to go, hey, I'm just going to get rid of this app for you because it seems like you've not used it in a while. And you know what the worst thing is? When that's the app that you need on the plane and then you don't have internet to download it or you have to pay 20 bucks to connect to their really rubbish Wi-Fi and spend 45 minutes trying to download a two megabyte app. Um, and so if you've enabled that, it's not here anymore. It's not under settings, general storage. Where did it go? And the answer is, folks, it's under settings, app store, if you have enabled it. Because I, I enabled it at one point on my iPhone to show somebody, and I couldn't find out how to unenable it. Um, and so that is something that you will want to uh, make sure that you have disabled. If you're like if you're prepping everything to go on a trip or something, just do yourself a favor and disable that feature and re-enable it when you come home so that no app or data gets offloaded. Because the other thing is, is it will, um, it, it, I believe that a feature also modifies the um, iCloud storage on your device, like app uh, file, files that you've downloaded to use in pages and so on. Uh, so that is very useful to know about. Similarly, there's automatic downloads for apps and so on. And you can also, in the App Store settings, control how much data you can download over mobile. Now, I have a pretty decent mobile plan. So I've said, hey, ask me if it's over 200 megabytes but otherwise I just don't care. Um, uh, so it will let me download pretty much anything I want. And I can also, uh, you know, turn off some other app store specific settings, but check in the settings for your apps, what you can control for, you know, different networks and so on so that you can uh, take advantage of that. And, you know, maybe you end up tweaking some settings and then you come back and modify them when you come back from your trip uh, as, you know, 
if you're if you're going to be offline or struggling with your internet, it's worth taking advantage of all of these features. And speaking of features, uh, there is an app that I wanted to recommend. I don't have it installed on my iPad, unfortunately. It's only on my iPhone. Uh, but I have uh, or had um, a very large audiobook collection on CD. Uh, I still technically have it. I've given it to my grandmother on loan because she actually has a CD player and I only have a CD ripper. But I ripped all of mine and I put them into Plex. And there is a great app called Prolog, which I use to download my audiobook for my Plex library and listen to them on my iPhone. And it's a free app to download and give it a try and then it was a $4.99 one-time in-app purchase to um, just give me all of the features and I have to say you know it's it's a nice enough app it works really well it's got CarPlay integration which is great for those long trips and it's given me uh, a whole bunch of entertainment from books that I already had um, you know as I already had them on CD I didn't necessarily want to buy them again and and you know some of these are very difficult to get uh, nowadays they're children's audiobooks and so on so I'm glad that I, I was able to get those but Micah, I know you have a different suggestion for your favorite offline audiobooks. Yeah, I was just going to mention um, Audible is the and also a, a sponsor of the network, but uh, is an app that I've used for ages and ages to uh, keep myself entertained and engaged and uh, to you know complete different things I need to do uh, with my hands, but don't necessarily need to do so much with my brain. And so I do listen to Audible a lot and. Uh, it is really one of my favorite ways to uh, pass travel time. I used to live in Missouri and uh, we Midwesterners very much enjoy, or not, I shouldn't say necessarily enjoy, but are not bothered by doing a lot of travel. Uh, something that I've noticed, driving travel, I, I should say, uh, something that I've noticed is not as uh, common here in California. And, uh, you know, every single minute seems to be considered here in California. Whereas, uh, back in Missouri, if I was in, uh, Columbia, Missouri, which is in the middle of Missouri and was, uh, needing to visit my home, which was in St. Joseph, Missouri, up to the Northwest from where Columbia is, it's about a three and a half hour, uh, trip. And that is, that is of note too. Three and a half hours. By that, I mean, it takes three and a half hours to get there here in California. When you tell, whenever you're talking to someone, they factor in the trip there and the trip back. So that's a, uh, it's a seven hour trip, not a three and a half hour trip. Uh, but for us in Missouri, that's what it was. When I was traveling, I loved to listen to audiobooks. Um, and so using Audible to download those books directly to my device was something that I uh, did regularly. And in fact, there was one time where um, I was staying in a hotel in, uh, my, and I guess it would have been in my college town, um, a university town, uh, visiting some friends after, uh, after I'd left. And I, uh, had checked out and got in my car and realized that I had forgotten to download, uh, the audible audiobook that I wanted to listen to. And at the time, Audible actually did not let you use cellular data to download audiobooks because they had gotten complaints way too many times, as my uh, my guess, uh, from people who had accidentally used cellular data to download audiobooks and ended up going over their data cap. So I uh, went to the parking lot of the hotel where I had stayed and sat outside and luckily the connection was still there even though I had checked out and <laughs> waited for my audiobook to download so that I had it to listen to on the uh, trip back to uh, my my hometown so yeah I I definitely love listening to audiobooks on, uh, during travel and uh, they're such a great pastime so definitely wanted to mention that as one of the apps that I use uh, anything yes. else that you want to mention there of course, books can be downloaded uh, to uh, read offline as well, like, uh, you know, sort of ebooks rather than audiobooks. Um, and uh, the Kobo app, Apple Books, and the Kindle app, they're all great solutions for that. I'd also like to mention if you're looking to give yourself some entertainment and you've realized that your internet's not as great as you thought it was, but you don't have stuff offline, ebooks are a really great sort of bang for your buck as it goes for the download time to entertainment time payoff solution because you can download a uh, relatively long book in just a few megabytes. Um, so that's definitely worth keeping in mind if you're if you're looking for something like that. 
Um, and uh, of course, you know, there's 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 lots of the media apps that we've already recommended. There's some games as well, which are really great offline. Mikey, you've talked about Destiny before, um, or sorry, Divinity. Uh, I'm yeah. struggling to remember which one it is. Uh, whichever one, the one that you've recommended before, we'll find a link to that and put it in the show notes. And the other one I want to recommend is Civilization VI on the iPad is such a great way to pass the time. Uh, and you can multiplayer and you can uh, multiplayer like over a local network that you can build um, over Wi-Fi, obviously. Uh, but you can also multiplayer by passing your device to other people or you can just play against the computer and it works completely offline. And it's uh, definitely a great uh, game. You get the first 60 turns for free. I will give you a spoiler right now. 60 turns is not enough. <laughs> 60 turns in, you will be hooked and you will be willing to pay. It is uh, quite pricey. It's $49.99 uh, one time in a purchase, I believe. But it's well worth having uh, as a game to pass the time with. And that's one of the ones that I always keep on my device. A number of times I've ended up playing that uh, because it is just a great way to pass the time. Is is huge. And now I have Divinity Original Sin. That's the one, Micah. Thanks for putting that there in the show notes uh, for me um, as well to help me pass the time. So it's two great games that work really well such, on the iPad. Such a good story. Uh, Divinity Original Sin 2. It's available for $25 in the App Store. And I promise you it is worth every dollar uh, because it is a very long game. Uh, it took me you know, uh, many days to uh, finish and has such a great story and you really fall in love with the characters that you uh, have join your party and it's it's wow. Like I'm constantly checking uh, to see if the company behind this game uh, is bringing different games to iPad because I just couldn't believe that they were able to put this on the iPad in the first place. Uh, it is mm -hmm. a beautifully written game and it is a lot of fun and well worth checking out. Um, all right. Uh, any, anything else that you want to mention for, uh, going offline with devices or are we ready to move on to the news? I think I should just mention, of course, you can take your podcast with you offline. You can download podcasts and have them offline using whatever your favorite app is. I personally like o Overcast for audiobooks, but I know uh, lots of folks really love Pocket Casts because of the really granular download controls. And especially if you're doing uh, this sort of thing on a regular basis, you're going to want those extra uh, features available to you. Uh, of course, the Apple Podcasts app can do downloads offline, but a little bit of a uh, word of warning, it can get a little over-enthusiastic downloading <laughs> some of the catalog. Um, I say this, uh, somebody in our chat room earlier mentioned this, uh, they they realized, uh, James realized that he had 300 gigabytes of uh, iOS Today video podcasts stored on his Mac Studio, which explained why he was, you know, seeing his, his SSD fill up pretty fast and it syncs between all your devices. Um, so yeah, I, I would uh, mention it's good that you can download things, but double check your settings to make sure it's not chewing up all of your data on your other devices too. Yes, please check that. All right, let us move on to the... Actually, I think we can take uh, another break and then we will move on to the news. Uh, I want to tell you about our second sponsor of the episode today. Another great one. It is 8Sleep who are bringing you this episode of iOS today, uh, both in sponsoring it and also because I woke up ready to do this episode thanks to 8Sleep. We know that good sleep is the ultimate game changer and the pod, the pod is the ultimate sleep machine. See, consistent good sleep can actually help reduce the likelihood of serious health issues. It can decrease the risk of heart disease. It can lower your blood pressure. And folks, it can even reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. Plenty of studies in sleep uh, that have looked at the regenerative nature of sleep. And despite what we know about sleep, still more than 30% of Americans struggle with sleep and it turns out that feeling hot at night is one of the main causes of poor sleep. Yes, uh, being too warm when you're trying to fall asleep and actually being too warm after you have fallen asleep results in poorer sleep. Uh, we know that sleeping in a cool room or having, in this case, a cool bed is one of the best ways to make sure that you are going through all of the stages of sleep in your circadian rhythm throughout the entire sleep cycle. I have, in the past, uh, slept so 
warm. I would wake up, I'd just be sweaty. It was just not fun. And in fact, funny story, um, I have the Pod Pro cover. It is a device that goes over the top of uh, over the top of a cover. It's the Pod 2 Pro cover. It goes over the top of the mattress that you have. And I needed to, I had made some changes to my Wi-Fi network, and so I needed to reset my uh, Pod 2 Pro cover. So I unplugged it, and normally you give it like 10 seconds, you plug it back in, that's how you reset a lot of devices that are connected to the Wi-Fi. Uh, but my distractible self got distracted after I had unplugged it and went off to do something else, forgot that it was unplugged, went to bed, woke up in the middle of the night for the first time in five ever, that's more than forever. And unfortunately, I was sweaty. I was, you know, a return to form. And I was like, oh no, the eight sleep, what's going on? And I looked down and realized I forgot to plug it in again. And so that there is a testament to the power that the Pod 2 Pro cover has been for me because up to that point, I had not had one of those nights where I did not sleep well because of heat at night. Now I can fall asleep in record time faster than ever because of the 8 Sleep Pod. 8 Sleep offers the only sleep technology that dynamically cools and heats, if that's something that you want to do, each side of the bed to maintain the optimal sleeping temperature for what your body needs. It pairs dynamic cooling and heating with biometric tracking. You can add the pod cover to any mattress and start sleeping as cool as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. The result, clinical data, yes, they've done some studies show that eight sleep users experience up to 19% increase in recovery, up to 32% improvement in sleep quality, and up to 34% more deep sleep. That means that you can be the most confident version of yourself, knowing that you are moving through those restorative sleep stages. So very important. They're so vital for physical recovery, for hormone regulation, for mental clarity. Oh, and by the way, 8sleep recently launched the next generation of the pod, the new pod Three, count them, enables more accurate sleep and health tracking because it doubles the amount of sensors delivering you the best sleep experience on earth. And they've also somehow made it more comfortable too. I was reading about the Pod 3, sort of drooling over the Pod 3. Uh, eight Sleep hit me up. And the Pod is not magic, of course, but it certainly does feel like it. I I don't know what I'd do without my uh, Pod 2 Pro cover. It's just fantastic. Uh, go to 8sleep.com slash iOS to start sleeping cool this summer and save $150 at checkout on the pod. 8sleep currently ships within the USA, Canada, the UK, and select countries in the EU and Australia. That's 8sleep.com slash iOS. Please go there. Let them know you heard about it on this show and that you want to get better sleep. 8sleep.com slash iOS. All right. On to the news. Uh, the first one that I wanted to mention, I, uh, not too terribly long ago, did a story here uh, for, for Twitter video uh, talking about Apple's self-service repair program. I have an iPhone 12, and I was going to replace the battery in the iPhone 12 using Apple's self-service repair program. And uh, it was a miserable experience, frankly. Uh, I, I talked about it in the video, I think it was for a hands-on tech, but I can't remember for sure. And in the video, um, basically what had happened was uh, Apple's uh, company that they use called Spot um, sent the tools that I needed for the repair, but did not send the, or the battery did not arrive at the same time as the tools. And unfortunately, the countdown for the rental of the tools started at the time that the tools were delivered to me. You have seven days with the tools. And because of the time when the tools were shipped and the time when the battery was shipped, uh, and then also because of several delays for some reason for the battery uh, along the way, it resulted in me needing to ship back the tools before the battery ever actually arrived. So I did not get to complete the self-service repair program using Apple's uh, specialized tools, and uh, it was not a lot of fun. 
However, some people have done this process and were able to get everything that they needed to do so. And so I wanted to mention that the self-service repair program has expanded to include Apple's M1 MacBook Air and MacBook Pro notebooks. Uh, the repair guides and the Apple parts and tools that are genuine from Apple are now available in the self-service repair store at selfservicerepair.com. And so you are able to purchase uh, the necessary components to get those. I'm going to go to the website now and uh, do complete a new order. Uh, I will choose the Mac. Uh, I will choose the MacBook. Let's go with the 13-inch MacBook Pro uh, from 2020 with the M1 chip. And, oh, Fooey, do I need to do my serial number? Yeah, it looks like I need to do my serial number, so I can't uh, get to that part. Um, unfortunately, well, drat, I was going to see what they had available, um, for, for purchase there, but, uh, without that, I can't, I can, however, use the Mac repair manual. And so I will go there and look at what, um, seems to be included whenever you do the repair. Uh, here we go. Exploded view and orderable parts. Uh, you can order a new bottom case for the Mac. You can order an embedded DisplayPort connector cowling, the DisplayPort flex cable. Uh, the You can order a new audio board that also includes the speaker, the touch ID board, and the connector cowling, a new logic board, a new audio board flex cable, a new battery, of course, new speakers, uh, Touch ID itself, the uh, trackpad, antenna, display. You can order a full display, which is cool. Um, and a few other bits and bops, including uh, the top case that also includes the keyboard. So if you want to replace the top case on the M1 MacBook Air, uh, then you will have to uh, buy the, the, the keyboard case as well. The M2 MacBook Air, um, despite being available, is not on this site yet, and that doesn't surprise me, given that it is a uh, newer product that they're still trying to just ship <laughs> in general. So that is available now for folks who really want to uh, go about the self-service repair program for those specific devices. Um, and Apple, as, is, as it has said in the past, continues to uh, add more parts to the self-service repair store so that you can purchase those uh, and repair your devices yourself. All right, let's move on to talk about um, the uh, iPhone 12 issues. Can you tell us about this? Because I, I hadn't heard about this iPhone 12 issue. Yeah, so there is a, uh, Apple has publicly acknowledged a serious audio problem which affects a very small percentage of iPhone 12 and 12 Pro devices, which were manufactured between October 2020 and uh, April 2021, where basically um, you might actually not have audio uh, when you're making a phone call, which is slightly <laughs> problematic to say the least, as you know, I phone is the name of the product but either way there there this is a known problem and apple have extended your period to get this fixed so you now have an extra uh year but if you are having this issue or you have an iphone 12 and you think that you're having a an issue with phone calls where there is no audio when you're making phone calls get it fixed asap don't hang around and wait on it thinking you don't make phone calls very much or you can use your airpods to tide you over in the meantime um, you know, at some point the program will disappear. If you try and get it fixed now, it's going to be much easier than the last day of the program and you run into somebody who's not heard of this because they're new and it's being discontinued. So nobody told them about the program. So I would just recommend if you think you've got this problem, take a look. We'll put a link to the news article in the show notes, which explains uh, in detail like what the problem is. But if you're having an issue with audio on phone calls using uh, your just your device, your handset, then that is probably it. And if it's an iPhone 12, 12 Pro, you can get that fixed, which is a very good thing to know about. Yes, uh, absolutely. And then uh, Apple One, which is Apple's subscription bundle that includes all sorts of good stuff, including Apple News Plus, Apple TV Plus, and uh, iCloud Plus, and all, again, uh, Apple Music. It's basically, it's all of the different uh, services, services, services that Apple provides. Um, that is making its way into bundles. Tell us about that. That's kind of exciting. 
Yeah, it's not only making it into bundles, it's making it into a bundle in the UK with my carrier. Woo! I Woo! actually get something like that. This this never happens, folks. Uh, here in the UK, it feels like I'm one of the last people to get nearly everything. Um, so uh, full works plan with Apple One is going to be available to customers on the EE network from August 31st. Um, they are going to be the only carrier offering this in the UK. They're also the only carrier with the, or they were the only carrier with the, uh, so the Apple Watch to start with, I think they may still be um but this is actually going to come as a bundle so i'm gonna hopefully find out whether or not my plan's eligible and if it's maybe already included as i do have the apple watch on my plan it seems like it's a possibility um and uh, i guess i'm gonna find out i know i can already get apple music as part of this so let's see what happens i will be our guinea pig and give it a try i'm already using apple one so i'm gonna have to do some kind of upgrade process where i stop paying for it like get it through my bundle, I guess. We'll find <laughs> yeah, out. doesn't that make we'll you kind of out. anxious? <laughs> yeah, a little uh, bit, but also it's only me in my Apple uh, family, so it's only oh, me that good. gets stuffed if it doesn't work. Uh, you know, if I had friends or, or my family members going, "Hey, like, why is Apple Music not working? Wait, where did Apple Fitness go? Why can't I play games anymore?" Uh, then I'd probably be a little bit reticent to do it. But I'll take one for the team, Micah, the Twit team. You know, we, we, we need the UK representative to give this a go, right? Amen. Absolutely. All right. With that, we've come to the end of the news. And that means it's time for Shortcuts Corner. Welcome to Shortcuts Corner. This is the part of the show where you write in with your shortcuts requests and Rosemary Orchard, our shortcuts expert, provides a response. Uh, the first Shortcuts Corner request comes from Doug. Uh, Doug writes in, thanks a lot for helping me make a shortcut to control my alarm on my work weekends a few weeks back. I have made many more shortcuts to control my alarm when I have days off. Just a tip I discovered. If you create the event as lasting more than one day, the search will not show it on the second day. You need to create each day as a separate event for the shortcut to work properly. And here's my additional kitty tax, meet Starbuck, all dressed up in his finest. Uh, this is the, the pet tax that we often have. And uh, in this case, we are going to get to see Starbuck, who apparently, oh, look at the bow tie. <laughs> so cool. So oh, cool. Love it. For, uh. for those of you listening and not watching, this is a beautiful, is, it, is that tabby? What's the color there? I don't know if there's a name for that specific color. That's, um, a, that's a ginger cat. Ginger cat. Ginger cat. Um, okay. Yeah. So if anybody yeah, wearing... knows Jorts from Jorts and Jean on Twitter of Reddit fame, then uh, Starbucks looks a little similar to Jorts. Uh, they're, they're both orange cats. Yes. And Jor or Jordan, uh, Starbuck is wearing an adorable little uh, red and black plaid bow tie and looks amazing. Uh, so do you want to briefly mention what uh, Shortcut Doug is referencing, Rosemary, that you helped with? Yeah. Back? Yeah. So, so uh, I, I don't remember which episode this was in. I did have a quick look back to see if I could find it, but uh, I unfortunately was a little limited on time. Um, and uh, but I do remember Doug writing in and he wanted to be able to set a work alarm automatically for the next day, but only when work was in the calendar. Um, and that's something that we were able to do. We we did a time shortcut, if I remember correctly, and had it automatically run and check the calendar for the next day to see if uh, there there was a work event and then set the alarm for before that. And that works really well for Doug. And he's used that to create a whole bunch of other things. It's just lovely to hear. Absolutely. And then Mark has written in. Mark says, hi, Mike and Rosemary. I'm loving the show. Hey, thanks, Mark. I'm back on iOS after spending a few years on Android, so Shortcuts is fairly new to me. There's a neat feature with an Android where when you turn off your alarm, you can have news played to you. I know that Siri can do a similar thing by asking, what's my update? Is there a shortcut or automation available that will allow this Siri command to be generated when you cancel an alarm? It would be incredibly useful. Many thanks in advance. Best regards, Mark. Ooh, this is a good one because there are mm. a lot of um, the the you know Google and its uh, Google what Nest devices as well as Amazon uh, with its Echo devices loves this idea of getting to wake you up in the morning and then sharing different little bits of news with you, and I think partially because of Apple's um, relative disconnect from the smart speaker market, even with the HomePod Mini, um, 
it is not something that's very front of mind, I think, for Apple. And it is something that I think people do want. So is there a way to go about making this possible using uh, shortcuts and perhaps Siri? Yes, that is the very simple answer. Yes, there is. Now, this really depends on what you want in your morning report, um, because the beauty and the downside of shortcuts is you need to figure out what data you want so that Siri can tell you. And I have, um, these are some older examples here. Um, I, I'll see if I can get some more updated ones of uh, things that you can do. So previously I was using the Dark Sky app to get some, some weather data and combining it together, getting the latest five uh, news items from Apple's news feed, um, checking um, you know uh, my calendar events for the day and just seeing if there, there was anything. If there weren't calendar events, there's no calendar events for today went in there. And then combining all of this text together in a block. And then um, there is a bonus trick that I want to mention on this. So if you use the, the speak text action, which is something that you can use in shortcuts, then it comes out as one very long block and it's all together and everything is all in one block and everything's all stuck to each other and there's no pauses in between any of it, even if there are separate sentences. If you split your text up into multiple lines, and so there's a great split lines action, then use the repeat with each to speak each of those, you get a pause between each one. And that can make your, your personal customized report sound so much better. But we have the report, we need an automation, right, to run it. So if we go into the automations tab and we tap plus and we click uh, create personal automation, then if you go into your alarm, then there is when your alarm is stopped. I should note, if you uh, do this on your iPhone, then you get to use your wake-up alarm. That's not something that you can do on an iPad. It only works on an iPhone. Um, but once you've done that, then when this uh, alarm is stopped, then you can use a run shortcut action to run your morning report to get whatever it is that you want to do. Um, so you have, you know, all of your data available and it just runs automatically. Now, when you do this, um, I will just uh, skip adding an action. Uh, you probably want to turn off Ask Before Running, but you may not want to. You may want it to pop up and say, you know, just offer to do the morning report um, or run your shortcut. Would you like to run your shortcut? And then you tap it because that way, if you're not quite awake yet and you're like, I, I need to go to the bathroom before my device is talk to me, please. Where's mm -hmm. the coffee? Um, then you can do that. Of course, if you have something that you can connect to HomeKit that will press the button on your coffee maker for you, you can have that go off automatically when you uh, when you uh, first uh, turn off your alarm and then maybe the second alarm that you turn off, you can have uh, do your uh, morning report for you so that you can at the very least be having a device talk to you as you stumble to the kitchen to get some coffee. Nice. All right. And uh, now it is time next to move on to our feedback and questions. Shortcuts Corner has ended and it's time to move on to our feedback and questions. The first question comes to us from Tom, uh, who has written in, I am using the iPhone 12 with a wired connection for CarPlay. In Apple Maps, sometimes I get a zoomed out view and sometimes I get a zoomed, I, I imagine that Tom meant to say, sometimes I get a zoomed out view, sometimes I get a zoomed in view. I prefer the zoomed in view. Can you help me with that? Love the show. Thanks for all you do, Tom. So this is, I think, um, what, what Tom is talking about is when you launch Apple Maps, you can kind of see a lot of the map or you can just see kind of a closer zoomed in version of the map. I do not have CarPlay in my vehicle. Uh, Rosemary, I believe you do. Have you I seen do. CarPlay switch between the two regularly? Do you know what Tom's talking about here? Yeah, so I do know what Tom's talking about, and I happen to have a screenshot that I took earlier. Um, and uh, so uh, this was actually taken. I was filing a bug report uh, with uh, this. If anybody can spot what the bug is, uh, then, you know, the, well done. You get a bonus point. But what can happen occasionally is that this view, um, bearing in mind uh, in the UK, we drive on the left-hand side of the road, the car, the steering wheel is on the right-hand side. So this is somewhat flipped from what a lot of you will see in your cars. Um, but this road area here, which for me is on the left, for most of you probably be on the right, uh, you can zoom out of that. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can actually zoom out using a pinch gesture. Um, but if you catch your finger on the screen or if you're uh, CarPlay doesn't have a touch screen and it's got like a control wheel or something, you might catch that by accident or something does that seemingly theoretically automatically to help you, which is not very helpful at times. You don't really want that. Um, but there is a really quick thing that you can do uh, to uh, 
uh, help fix this. So first of all, over on the left-hand side for me, this will be on the right-hand side for Americans, there is a um, a four arrow button, which points up, down, left, and right. And if you tap that, that will recenter you and that will take you back. So if it's, you know, if something's moved off the center of the screen, then that will put you back into the right place. And then um, you can use the plus and the minus buttons to uh, adjust the zoom. Now I have found once I hit one of the plus or the minus buttons, because hitting it once is very easy to do whilst driving, hitting it multiple times to get it back to the right zoom level, possibly not safe to do. So don't don't try and get it perfect. But if I do that, um, and then it will usually ping back to the properly zoomed in view that it should be using. Uh, the reason likely for you switching between the zoomed in and the zoomed out view is if you have no turnings in the next X distance. So if it knows that there's nothing happening in the immediate future, then it will try and zoom out to give you a bigger picture view of what's going on because there's no detail needed between now and then. Uh, this can be a little frustrating, but it should uh, zoom in automatically at the appropriate time. Nice. Beautiful. And then <clears throat> G. James writes in, thank you for reading this email. This is my first time writing in, loving the show through all its iterations and hosts. Thank you. Uh, I just recently stumbled onto an iOS feature. When setting or editing an event in calendar, if you tap the time picker or spinner, you can then type in the time instead of spinning the wheels, which can be faster, if not as fun. You are then no longer restricted to five minute increments for the time, which I thought was a limitation only evaded by using the desktop app. The added granularity is then also present on the wheel. This tip should work wherever a time picker control appears. This is a really uh, good tip that I think a lot of people are, are maybe not aware of because Apple um, has in the past actually tried to get away from that fun little rolly. I like the, the time picker where you kind of click through different options. And at one point, Apple had completely uh, nixed that entirely for a type in option, people didn't like it. <laughs> and so they ended up adding it back because uh, people were used to that and sort of changing it did not add any, um, well, I should say eliminating the feature that was already there uh, did not necessarily make anything better. Uh, so they kept it and let you still do it that way. But just because that's one way does not mean that you can't also use the tippity tappity typing controls, which is a very good tip. Yes, yes, I really appreciate this tip. Uh, it used to be when you were uh, in the calendar app and you were presented with the scroll wheels of doom, as some folks like to refer to them. I just call them scroll wheels of fun. That seems a lot better for me. Then if you double tapped the minutes, then it would switch you between one minute and five minute increments. Uh, and that could be very useful for uh, moving around. But you can now just one tap, which is a lot easier to discover for folks, you know, tapping on it and then it appears or disappears. And then you can just type in, so I could type in 15, uh, 96 that doesn't make any sense at all that's not a good time uh but if i typed in say uh uh 905 then or 605 as i managed to hit then that will uh automatically fill that in and of course you've got your backspace which resets you to midnight if you just backspace everything all right and with that it is time to enter the app cap segment This is the part of the show where we wear caps or other head coverings atop our heads to honor our app or gadget picks of the week. These are the apps or gadgets we are using uh, now that we want to share or, you know, have used at some point in the past that we want to share with all of you because we think they're great and we think you are great. Uh, I'm going to start today. I have got a yellow uh, paisley bandana atop my head. Uh, as I've mentioned in the past, I bought a whole pack of uh, pay of paisley bandanas in different colors so that I would have lots and lots of app caps to do on the show. So you'll continue to see these colors uh, make their way in. Today it is a bright yellow. I do also have like a golden color, uh, but this one's a bright, bright yellow. The app I want to talk about today is not an app. Uh, instead, I am covering a gadget. This is a brand new um, accessory from Moft, M-O-F-T, and it is called the MagSafe 
wallet stand. This is a $30 uh, stand that uses MagSafe on the iPhone. It holds your, uh, it holds up to three cards in it. So I'll show the front of it is uh, this leather that has kind of an hourglass shape on it. And if I pull out on the hourglass, inside is a pouch that will hold three cards. Uh, so I've got two in there just to kind of show it in use. And what you do is it's got the area on the back to MagSafe thwack to the back of my iPhone, like so. And it's a little um, off kilter, so I will just adjust that. Uh, that's one of the things when you're not using Apple's first party accessories, they can sometimes be a little bit uh, loose. But once it's on there and you've got it locked in place, you pull out the middle of that hourglass shape. And now it magnets down at the top and you have a stand that you can put uh, down on a flat surface. I'm trying to do that here on the show uh, to hold your iPhone up. So your leather wallet suddenly becomes a stand for your iPhone. And what's great about this is it works with the phone in portrait mode, but it also works with the phone uh, in in horizontal mode and landscape mode uh, on its side. So it can also stand your iPhone there on the side. I love this as a um, connected kind of always available stand for my iPhone versus, you know, just having a stand on my desk that will support it. So this is a great way to be able to carry your, uh, your, your cards that you use regularly uh, while also including a built-in stand so that you can set your phone down and know uh, what's on the screen. And it's just so, it's so well done in the way that it, um, kind of magnets down and magnets back up and lays flat on the back of your iPhone. Um, and I got the brown leather, which looks great with the green color of the case that I have on my iPhone. So it's this beautiful uh, brown leather with, uh, with the dark green. And anytime I want to take it off, I can just undo the MagSafe connection and thwack it back on whenever I'm ready. And you can see that one was actually a lot better. It was much more aligned that time uh, as I just kind of let the magnets do their thing as opposed to me placing it too directly. So at 30 bucks, it just was like, wow, this is a great uh, price. I, I'm definitely going to check this out. And uh, yeah, it's it's awesome. $30, the Moft MOFT MagSafe wallet stand. And Moft has cases that are similarly kind of origami-esque in their unfolding for the iPad uh, and other cases for the iPhone. All right, with that, it is time to hear about Rosemary Orchard's app cap and app atop Rosemary's head. Yes, yes, and as of course our lovely folks behind the scenes have seen, I'm wearing a traffic cone on my head. I, I can assure folks this is a lot comfier than a traffic cone. I've also slumped down in my chair, so if you're watching the video, you should be able to see the full traffic cone. There we go. It's it's all in shot. Uh, I'll sit back up a little bit. Um, and the traffic cone is in honor of a, a bonus tip that I want to remind folks of, which is VLC is a great app to use when you're offline. If you've got videos stored on your device, it will let you play them. I carry a like one terabyte USB, like it looks like a USB stick. It's a larger USB stick, but I carry a one terabyte SSD with me. And it's uh, I can plug it into my iPad thanks to that great USB-C port and just play videos back from it. So I always have media with me, even if I didn't remember to download it in the first place. I've got, you know, the classics on there, Back to the Future, that sort of thing. But speaking of classics, there's an app that I think we all miss. And that app was Flight Control. And Flight Control was a great app. You know, you had landings, you had different kinds of planes, you had to guide the green plane to the green landing strip, the blue plane to the blue landing strip, red to red. And they come in at different speeds. You had to make sure they didn't crash into each other. And if you go and look in your purchase section in the App Store, it, it's gone. It, it's not there. You can't download it anymore. And if you tap on it, you, you get that it couldn't connect to the Aww. App Store. And I've been really sad about this for a long time. And then I saw a tweet the other day where somebody found what looked like flight control in the United app of all things. And then somebody else went digging and they found that there is an app by Rare Pixels called, uh, it's called uh, Plane Control or Planes Control. And Planes Control has a couple of different uh, versions of playing this. Uh, there is the classic version, and this looks very similar to our good old-fashioned uh, flight control app, where you touch a plane and you, you bring it to the landing strip, 
And, uh, you know, it, it's just how the game used to work where you're just guiding planes into land. So you've got your planes, helicopters. I've got red and yellow planes to start with. I can speed this up a little bit to um, uh, get things going where they're supposed to be going so I can... Uh, just, oh, I'm going to uh, try and drag the yellow one onto there. And when you drag uh, something onto the right kind of landing strip, then once you get to a certain point, then it just sort of uh, cl uh, sort of gloms on automatically, which is quite nice. But as you can see, if you're watching the video, I am drawing patterns around to try and make sure that these planes do not collide with one another because that would not be good if they did. Um, oh, uh, no, I don't think that that's actually a problem there. You know, computer... Flight control uh, were worried that I was going to have a collision for a moment, but I don't think I will. Now, here's where I might end up with a collision because uh, I've got a yellow plane coming in from one way and a red plane coming in from another. Let's fast forward a little bit and see if we make it. Uh -uh -oh. I think I'm okay. Yes. Yes, I made it just about. Well, I will pause that and leave that so I can finish that later. But I found flight control again, only it's called planes control. It's a free app to download from the app store. Uh, there are some uh, in-app purchase options available, but it's it's great. Just give it a, give it a go, uh, whether or not you've played this game before. It's very easy to pick up and give it a go again if you have or if you're brand new to it. It can be a great way to well away the time. And there's something fun about flying planes into land whilst on a plane. Indeed, indeed. Uh, that actually, yeah, and I bet that could be a bit therapeutic even uh, if you have yeah. some anxiety around uh, flights. If you are sitting there and you're you're landing your own planes, then that might help you feel a little bit better. Um, in uh, who knows, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I want to thank everybody, of course, for tuning in to this episode of iOS Today. If you have feedback, questions, concerns, uh, shortcuts, corner requests, you can send those to us. It's iOS Today at twit.tv. Uh, super easy to do. If you'd like to tune in to watch the show live, we do record the show live every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. You just go to twit.tv slash live to watch us on a bunch of different streaming services, uh, including uh, Twitch and YouTube Live, etc. Uh, but we think the best way to get the show is by subscribing or following the show, which you can do by going to twit.tv slash iOS. There you will find buttons, subscribe to audio, subscribe to video, that include links to the different services and platforms where we are publishing the show, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so heading there is your best bet for getting the show as soon as it's available. We would love it if you checked out our very cool service, Club Twit, twit.tv slash club twit. For seven bucks a month or $84 a year, you get quite a bit of stuff. First, you get all of our shows ad free. So this show included uh, without any ads. It's just the content. You get access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra content you won't find anywhere else, including behind the scenes, before the show, after the show, etc. And you get access to the members-only Discord server. That is a fun place to go to chat with your fellow Club Twit members and also those of us here at Twit. Uh, it's a great place to ask uh, questions and get feedback for iOS Today directly. And in fact, just today, uh, I was inspired by... Uh, Doug M in the chat to do an episode soon regarding sleep and sleep apps because it's been a while since we've uh, talked about sleep on the show. So we'll have to do one of those episodes soon. Uh, Twit.tv slash club twit. You'll also get access to my show, which publishes every Thursday, uh, Hands on Mac, and it is a show about all of the various Apple devices. We're keeping that same name, but uh, the goal here is to cover all of Apple's devices and give tips and tricks for all of them. So if you would like to check out that show, these are shorter format shows, just uh, me and the different topics that I cover. Uh, I think the most recent one was about privacy and uh, how you can kind of make sure that apps are not uh, tracking you online. And I think, oh, also, uh, hands on Windows, if that's your place to be, while well, Paul Therott is there to provide you with tips and tricks for Windows users. Twit.tv slash club twit to check all of that out, and we thank you in advance. Rosemary Orchard, if folks want to follow you online and check out all the great work that you do, where should they go to do so? 
Uh, well, the best place is rosemaryorchard.com, which has links to all the things I do all around the internet, including this wonderful podcast. And of course, you can also find me on Twitter at Rosemary Orchard and hanging out in that Club Twit Discord uh, with uh, all of the other folks, uh, some of whom have been making some great show suggestions. Somebody has linked me to a Wyoming scale for uh, measuring wind using this hat. So I'm going to possibly go and try that outside. I'm a little scared that I might end up uh, having a low flying train. Um, it seems a little windy outside. But I guess I'll see later. And uh, at the very least, I get to talk to some amazing folks uh, whilst we record the show and after. Micah, where can folks find you? Well, you can find me online at Micah Sargent, or you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A dot coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. Uh, and you can check me out on Thursdays for Tech News Weekly, as well as Hands on Mac on Saturdays for the Tech Guy radio show heard around the world and in various other places online, including uh, a podcast called uh, Total Party Kill, which is a Dungeons and Dragons actual play podcast uh, that I record many a Tuesday um, live, including tonight, totalpartykill.live at, I think, 4. 5 30 p.m eastern or 5 30 p.m pacific today uh in any case you could just follow me on twitter if you want to check that out thank you all for tuning in to this episode of ios today we hope that you have uh, got some great tips for taking your devices offline and we will see you again next week goodbye Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, editor of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I'm joined by Tarek Malik, the editor-in-chief over at Space.com, in our new This Week in Space podcast. Every Friday, Tarek and I take a deep dive into the stories that define the new space age. What's NASA up to? When will Americans once again set foot on the moon? And how about those samples from the Perseverance rover? When are those coming home? What the heck has Elon Musk done now? In addition to all the latest and greatest in space exploration, we'll take an occasional look at bits of spaceflight history that you probably never heard of, and all with an eye towards having a good time along the way. Check us out on your favorite podcatcher. Podcatcher.